Hey folks, welcome back to the Inside Line F1 podcast. And this time on, we are going to be talking about the Brazilian GP with Peter Windsor. Now, as we discussed, we're going to have him on for a live race watch along on Paytm Insider for this weekend. And we'd love for you to join in. So don't forget to check out the link in the description to join, to, to figure out how you can actually join us over there as we discuss, discuss lots of things, including driving styles with all the drivers, the race strategy, all the action. And you get the chance to interact with Peter as the race goes on. So it should be a ton of fun. But on the subject of Brazil, let's actually get Peter's take on so many fun things. And Peter, firstly, welcome back to the Inside Line F1 podcast. And the first thing I really want to know your take on is how do you prefer Brazil as a, as a place where you'd like to see the last race of the season or the first race? Because back in the day, we used to have that as well. We used to have the Rio circuit starting off the season. But what do you feel is the ideal location or the ideal time for Brazil on the Formula One calendar? Oh, I think it should be at the front of the calendar, definitely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We used to have the Brazilian Grand Prix then, right at the start of the year in some cases, Rio and also Sao Paulo. And there's a certain atmosphere about the new year, the sunshine, the carnival feel of the Brazilian Grand Prix at that time of year. That's not to say that it doesn't exist at the back end of the year as well. But for me... That's always been Australian Grand Prix time. Call me an old timer, but to me, it's always kind of nice to finish in Australia and then everybody goes off on holiday somewhere. But Brazil has an energy to it, a bit like South Africa, which kind of belongs at the start of the year. Uh, I've got very fond memories of the original Interlagos. I was lucky enough to have been there. 74, I think, was the first race. 75, I think, was the first race I went to. Uh, certainly there in 77. And then uh, Rio, too, was brilliant. Loved it. Loved the venue. Circuit was a little bit wonky, but it was a great, great race. I think one thing, I know you, we're going to ask questions, but I think one thing that's really interesting is given the weirdness of the two wet races we've just had in Singapore and Japan, there's half a chance, of course, it will be wet in Brazil. And, and, that's, and it'll be interesting to see whether the teams have got on top of the procedures and how we run in the wet. I mean, there are so many things that have arisen from those two races that there'll be a lot of question marks, I think, going into Brazil. Yeah, exactly. And as it always is over there, it's always a circuit that offers new challenges. But somehow, Interlagos always finds a way to be entertaining. I, I don't remember a boring Brazilian Grand Prix for a very long time. And I want to know your thoughts on that. Just what makes Interlagos so good? And also, why did we change the original layout? Because as you mentioned, back in the day, we used to have a longer one, and perhaps a crazy one as well. Oh, yeah, I think Interlagos produces good racing because it's got lots of good corners it's got a reasonably long straight and it's got a corner that rewards very good exits uh, before that long straight which is good and it's got high speed braking it's got medium speed high speed it's got hairpins it's undulating the weather changes the variables come into play so if you put all that together it's much more than the average relatively boring new grand prix circuit it's got got a lot of stuff the other point, of course, as we were saying, the original Interlagos, uh, it used to double back on itself, if you like, and you can still, we're still using little bits of that track, but what we don't have anymore is the amazing Curva del Sol, which was a constant radius, very fast right-hander. It's now basically the car park area for all the B division of the Formula One paddock. <clears throat> the drivers and team owners and stuff park at the top, but if you're next division, you park down what used to be the Curva del Sol. And of course, a lot of people today park their rental van there and get their stuff out and walk to the track. And they're probably not even thinking, I'm walking on the bit of road or right here, this is where Patrick Depaillet was sideways in the six-wheel Tyrrell, or this is where Jean-Pierre Jarrier and Tom Price set the world on fire in the shadows, or where Carlos Reutemann was balancing the Ferrari 312T2 on an edge. And you know, But I always think of those things. You know, I think of Ronnie, I think of Mario, I think of a lot of guys when I'm, when I'm at that place where the Curva del Sol is, one of the great corners of Formula One, sadly no longer with us. Do you reckon the changes have made the circuit better or worse? Because as you mentioned, it still produces good racing, but does it have the same character as the old Interlagos? Well, I mean, part of the problem with that circuit was that turn one was really, really quick. Turn two was really quick. Indeed, it was kind of designed as, a, as an oval as well as an infield track. And, and what you have, turns one, two, and I think even three were parts of an original oval. And, and so it was so quick and they were banked. And then I think it was 78, there was a lot of 
might have been 77, I can't remember, but at the end of the back straight coming out of turn two, going into three, or into three, the track started breaking up something awful and there were quite a lot of incidents there and people went off and I think it was just generally considered it was getting to be too quick. There was no runoff area for any of those corners and if we had today's cars going around that circuit, I think you'd find, well, it would be impossible really, it would be so quick. So <laughs> it's probably a good thing that we have the circuit layout that we have now and they've kept a lot of the character of that original Interlagos. So as a guy that on, on one side of my brain, I think I really miss Ronnie Peterson sideways uh, in a load of 72 or, or Emerson um, or Jackie Stewart fighting the short wheelbase Tyrrell around there in 73. I really miss all that. On the other side, what I don't miss is the is the danger of it all. You know, the safer we can make it, the better ready, I think. So I think we've got a nice compromise there. But that was not the only old layout that we had as well. Back in the day, early on in the season, Formula One used to travel all the way through Rio. Now, were you a big fan of that layout? It's actually the place where they've got the new Olympic Park, haven't they? Were you a big fan of that circuit? Uh, well, I don't know about the Olympic Park, but I was, well, I was I was always a fan of the Brazilian Grand Prix, for sure. And I think I always preferred going to Rio to Sao Paulo. Who wouldn't? I don't want to offend the Sao Paulistas when I say that. But going to Sao Paulo is always a bit of a production because of the pollution, the traffic, the airport's miles from the... The city, well, because of the traffic, it's hours from the city. And in a Monday morning after the race, you would wake up in a sweat wondering what time you should leave the hotel in order not to miss the flight. Should I leave a five-hour margin or a seven-hour margin or whatever? Rio is a completely different deal. You know, the whole place was buzzing and it was easy, relatively easy to get in and out. We all stayed at the Sheraton on the beach, which is a very dodgy beach, i got to say. And there were some nasty incidents there. Nigel Mansell actually rescued Elio De Angelis from drowning on that beach. And Jonathan Palmer, of course, had an incident when he was mugged. A few other things went on. But, you know, I, I can remember running along the beach with Carlos Reutemann um, before the 78 race, Ipanema Beach. You know, that's those things are pretty valuable, really. I mean, not valuable. They're gold, really, aren't they? Those moments. And... Uh, so Rio was great. Yeah, we'd, we'd, and we'd go out there literally two weeks before the race because everyone would be tire testing for two weeks. And so you were in that place for three weeks. And we were just like a family in that hotel. I felt it had a lot of fun, obviously. But there was a track every day and it was hot, but you got into the rhythm of things. And the, the track itself was not bad. I, it was flat. I mean, that was the thing about it. But it was there were some quite nice corners. There were... There was some reasonably quick corners in the first sector, if that's the right word. Then you had the back straight, which is directly opposite the pits, which is always a nice thing because you could look at top speeds. And then the corner at the end of the straight was was quite quick. There were a couple of quick corners after that. It was a little bit like Hereth in layout, I think. And uh, I liked mm. it. It was a great circuit. And uh, great shame that it didn't continue, like a lot of things in Formula One, to be honest. But I, I've got very fond memories of uh, driving back from the track there with Gilles Villeneuve. I think in a Fiat 127 or the Brazilian equivalent thereof one year. And, um, yeah, you know, that was, would have been, what, 82, I guess. And, and, uh, and Gilles had this thing about, you know, don't stop for traffic lights and, um, well, don't stop in general, really. <laughs> so don't stop for traffic lights, but if there's a blockage, use the footpath or whatever just to keep going. That was quite fun with Gilles. And, of course, his judgment was brilliant. And, uh, you know, once or twice... We got into a couple of scrapes, but it was a lot of fun. Oh, we that, that, that's a crazy story for a crazy little place. I mean, generally, that, that was incredible to hear. And I, I actually, speaking of Rio, remember a lot about those battles where we had the likes of Senna, Mansell, PK. But there's one thing I've always been confused about. When we hear of Senna, we always think of the hero of Brazil. But Nelson PK, well, he's won the same number of championships, was one my claim. It was also, I mean, okay, it depends on person to person, but many also rank him pretty highly. But why do people not rate him as high as Ayrton Senna, especially back in Brazil, where Senna is considered to be, let's say, a phenomenon, but PK isn't quite as much? Well, I think the Brazilians are quite astute, aren't they? And they can see that Senna was a better driver than Nelson PK, probably. Simple as that. Um, I think a better question, to be honest, is why Emerson Fittipaldi isn't on a higher pedestal than hmm. the one on which he sits. Because without Emerson, we may not have had. We may not have had Senna or PK. I mean, he started it all and he was really good, Emerson. I mean, he was at least as good as Nelson, if not better. Well, definitely better, I think, in my view. Nelson, I think the problem with Nelson that he, was that he drove for Bravo and it was always a bit sort of seedy, wasn't it? The whole thing about, you know, that in 81, when he eventually won the championship, effectively by default, because Carlos Reutemann won it that year, but 
having three months after winning the South African Grand Prix, they decided to strip that race of points. And the guy that did that was Bernie Eccleston, whose driver then went on to win the championship. I mean, it was the most ludicrous thing that everybody that he was allowed to get away with that year. But nonetheless, Nelson did get that championship in the end by one point. But it was in a car that had ridiculous advantage for quite a lot of races because they just had a new six centimetre ride height rule. And Brabham effectively, I'm not going to use the word cheated because they got away with it, but they circumnavigated the rule with a, a way of dropping the car down to the road. So it was effectively full ground effect when everybody else was running high, you know, and that, those sorts mm. of things. I mean, Ayrton, Ayrton didn't win races that way. He won races because he was a super quick driver, whereas Nelson always had that bit of a, you know, thing about him. And when he was at Williams, he got blown away by Nigel anyway. So, you know, I think that I mean, when did when did Ayrton get blown away by a teammate the way Nelson did in uh, at Williams? So I think it's that really, and I think the Brazilians are say quite discerning. You know, they would have known that Ayrton was the pure racing driver, whereas Nelson always needed these sort of extra bits and bobs to to give him the win. Generally, I mean, there, there were occasions when he was really good, but overall, I think that's the way history looks at Nelson Piquet. Hmm. And that brings us on the subject of Senna as well, because obviously we've all. We, we all know about the story. We all know how phenomenal he was and the kind of uh, the kind of sensation he became. But when we were at the time, what's the first time we actually realised that this guy was actually the real deal? Or was it uh, before Monaco 1984 when he had that second place finish with Dolman? Or was it uh, was it some, maybe at that very race instead? Well, I, I was at 84 and I was at Rio in 84 when he made his Formula 1 debut in the Dolman. And I remember being interviewed on the Friday before that race, I think it was, by Brazilian TV. And they said, Peter, what do you think is the most uh, significant, you know, what, what what is the big thing to watch out for this weekend? And I said, well, without doubt, it is the debut of Ayrton Senna because this guy is for sure going to win a multitude of world championships. And here we are, he's making his debut in Brazil in front of his home crowd in a Tolman. And this is a, a, a time moment when time stops really because this is the most significant thing that we've had for a long long time and and so i said that then that was well before monaco obviously so i think i think i, I spoke for most f1 people at the time we all knew how, how good Ayrton was we'd all been watching him in in formula three and then before that ford 2000 which supported a couple of grand prix and most of the formula one people in those days took the trouble to watch the support races which they don't anymore and uh and so I you know I think Ayrton was always considered by people who knew what they're talking about to be that good. Having said that, um, for me, Nigel Mansell was always right up there with Ayrton, and, and so was Alan Pross. So you know, I'm not one of these people who would say he was the greatest racing driver of all time. By f- by any means, would I say that? I think you know I still I would say Jim Clark was if I was really pushed into that corner, and I would say that I can't think of a situation or an area in which Ayrton was actually better than Nigel. To be honest, I don't think he was better in the wet. I don't think he was better through chicanes. I don't think he was better on street circuits. I don't think he was better on the semi-wet. I don't think he was better on medium speed or fast corners. And I think Nigel was probably better on throttle application and just as good on on hand foot coordination with Manuel Gishev. So I don't see an area where Ayrton was better. I'm not decrying Ayrton, but I just don't think there was an area where he was better than Nigel Mansell. So would you claim the difference to be perhaps being at the right place in the right time or maybe a little bit of luck as well? Between, I mean, when you consider the difference in the well, number I, of world I don't believe in luck. I mean, luck is, you know, there's a cause, and there's a cause behind every event that happens and, and an effect. I believe in causality, hmm. not in luck. But... Um, I mean, if you look at Nigel's career, just talking about the comparison between Nigel and Ayrton, if you if you look now and say, well, this guy won whatever it is, 31 Grand Prix, therefore he must be categorised as a great Grand Prix driver. And then you look at the number of years in which he didn't have a race-winning car, you're looking at half his Formula One career. And I can't think of any great Formula One driver Who's fifty percent of their career was wasted by not being recognised and not being in a quick car? That hasn't. There's no other driver in the world about which you could say that. Ayrton was recognised as a potential world champion, as I say, before he got into Formula One, and there's quite a big fight about what team he was going to drive for. And he did have a long-term contract with Tolman, but he just kind of walked out of that and did the deal with Lotus mm-hmm. for '86. But um, you know, Nigel was never in a race-winning car until back end of '85, and he made his Formula One debut in 1980. So you tell me another great driver that's had to wait five years in order to be in a race-winning car. Mm, that, that is indeed a long time. And actually, on the subject of young drivers and getting opportunities and the chance to get in there, 
I really want to talk about Felipe Drugovic because now he seems like the next Brazilian driver to come in there. Obviously, we've had Felipe Massa in 2017, but since then, we've not really had many. Pietro Fittipaldi came in, but I would say that's more of a contractual deal than maybe Haas actually willing to get and nurture a new driver in. But do you think this shortage of Brazilian drivers that we've had in the recent past is more cyclical or is it more structured? And what, what do you see with Felipe Drugovic? How good do you think he is? I think Filipe Drugovic is very, very good. And I'm very disappointed that Formula One yet again hasn't created an opportunity for a very, very talented driver like that. And it's such a shame to see him having to take a test drive with Aston Martin. That's such a waste. I'd love to have seen him in the second Alpha Tauri. I'd like to see him in a Haas. I'd like to see him in a Williams. I mean, this guy deserves it. He's really good. Um, and I'm shocked, actually, at the, at the deal he's had to do at Aston Martin. He's paying Aston Martin five million to be a test driver and you'll probably never get to race that because despite what they may say the reality is that team only exists because Lawrence Stroll wants to have a race team for his son Lance and we know from the pattern that the other driver is a driver that Lance needs to be able to beat a third at least a third of the time if not half the time and that driver needs to be a driver of substance i.e with a world championship behind him or certainly a number of grand prix wins so it elevates lance's stature i can't see any way in the world they'll put in a really quick young guy in the other car that potentially is going to beat lance because how, how's that going to make lance look so i don't even see how he's going to get a race drive out of that and so i, I think he's it's a shame i don't think he should have panicked i think he should have waited a bit longer just to see what was out there because um, there are some potential openings appearing, you know, with Pierre, Pierre Gasly going to Alpine and you know, Alfa Tari suddenly taking a non-Red Bull driver, Nick De Vries. You know, there are opportunities now for him to have got something together, but to, to, to persuade his sponsor to spend $5 million on a test drive at Aston Martin is just a complete waste, in my, I think. Hmm. And... Um- what do you think goes on now? Should he perhaps have waited like Nick De Vries has and maybe bided his time? Because essentially what, what that means is there's no seat now for him. He's, he's just sitting there. Yeah, I know. Having made that mistake, I think it's a mistake. Having made that decision, I don't see where he's going to go now. It's a bit like saying to me, you know, what do you think Daniel Ricciardo can do with his career? Well, the answer is he should never have left Red Bull in the first place, which is what I was saying at the time. And if I'd been around, if he'd, if he'd rung me or other people like me and said, do you think I should leave Red Bull and go to Renault? I would have said no, you know, but having made that mistake, it's almost impossible then to say, what should you do next? If I was advising Felipe Drugovic, I would have said, don't sign that test deal with Aston Martin. Stay cool, stay calm. You'll get a lot of publicity being a, an F2 champion who doesn't have a drive and we will get something solid here. You know, Mercedes right now need a young guy in there to replace Nick De Vries. I mean, if you're going to do, if you're going to do, sim work and maybe a bit of testing and maybe an FP1 or two. At least do it with Mercedes. Don't do it with Aston Martin. And that's what I don't get. I mean, it's possible, I suppose, that at, that Mercedes have, have helped place him at Aston Martin and they're going to keep a close watch on him and perhaps they're going to use him a bit. But it's not the same, is it, as uh, as being on a Mercedes deal and a young driver at Mercedes. So um, even then, I, I, I'm still at a loss to know what he should do next, to be honest. Hmm. Let's hope he's able to find a seat and find a productive way to use this talent. But as well, yeah. we wrap off the set, is, so you see, well, I do think it's um, you know it's nice to see some of the other F two drivers being given an opportunity, particularly uh, hmm. Theo Pocher, who was at the who was at Austin in the in FP one for Alfa Romeo. I mean that's good, and uh, you know the, the, I think the talent pool in F two is very high at the moment, and some very very quick drivers there. Jack Doohan is another, quite obviously. So. Uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see where all those guys go. Yeah, fingers crossed that they're all able to find their way out in the best place. But now, as we end this episode, I just want to know your take on who, what would you rank as the best Brazilian GP performance? Because generally, we've got a few. We've got Hamilton from last year. We've got Edson Senna and his broken gearbox story from the past. We've got Felipe Massa from 2008, where he actually masterfully managed the conditions as well. But which one stands out for you the most? Well, I, I have to go back in time and say I think Carlos Reutemann's win in uh, both 77 and 78, 77 at Interlagos when he blew Nicky away in the Ferrari and basically that that triggered Nicky's year. As a result of that, Nicky went back to Fiorano and thought, right, we better get serious here. And he went on to win the championship, but it was Carlos's drive that triggered that at Interlagos in 77. And then 78, that was the first win for Michelin 
and Carlos was just stunningly good that day and disappeared into the distance on Michelin tyres. Absolutely brilliant. So those two races always stand in my memory as two of the greatest Brazilian Grand Prix, I think, of all time. I, I got a lot of um, a lot of respect for Felipe Massa, and I think to do what he did in 2008. I mean, he had to go go to that race and basically dominate it in order to have any chance to win the championship. And he did exactly what he was supposed to do. And, and he drove beautifully that weekend. I think he drove as well as he ever had throughout his career. And we know how good he was. You know, he was better than Michael around Turkey a number of times. So we saw the very best of Felipe Massa in front of his home crowd in 2008. And I would say that was one of the best wins I've seen uh, on the new Interlagos circuit. Really good. I think Lewis's win um, in the wet was fabulous. Max to around there. I mean, any driver of quality is going to show up. There have been some great moments too. You know, I think there was a moment, well, I think there was a moment when at a restart in his first year, I think at Williams, Montoya on cold tyres passed Michael on the outside going into turn one at a restart. Mm. That was a moment that we'll live in time. And Alex Wurtz was pretty quick at a restart one year, I remember as well. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that you, you that have been great around Interlagos. Um, in terms of pure car control, and sheer brilliance, I would say Jackie Stewart, 73 in the Tyrrell, as I mentioned earlier, short wheelbase, very difficult to drive Tyrrell, very bumpy circuit in those days. The thing was jumping from corner to corner, from bump to bump. And he finished second to Emerson in uh, in a car that was almost impossible to drive, I think, and, and that was brilliant. I mean, speaking of all that, it's interesting, we're going back to at the centre, 94 Brazilian Grand Prix, he spun coming out of a hairpin and stalled it. And that was the end of his race. It was the most unlike, un like event that you could possibly think of. And, and that was, you know, that's kind of a sad moment, wasn't it, that Ayrton's last Brazilian Grand Prix ended like that. But he had some great wins too. I mean, he had two wins in Brazil and they were great moments. I suppose also Emerson, I'm, you know, I'm jumping all over the place, but, you know, for Emerson to have won there in 73 was, 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 absolutely the greatest thing that could have happened for Brazilian motor racing as the new world champion. And James Hunt taking the pole in his first race for McLaren in 76 at Interlagos. How about that? You know, in terms of moments yeah. and what that meant for where Formula One was going, that was pretty serious. It's crazy how many incredible performances we've gotten to see over here yeah. at Interlagos, but it's, it's amazing, right? And it's come from all over the place, as you mentioned, from the 60s, 70s, now, okay. this weekend, if you just had to pick one thing, any one performance like that that you would be very willing to watch or very keen to watch, which one would it be for you? I've got, I've got my eyes on Max. I really want to see how many places he can gain. Because, like, I mean, if Lewis Hamilton can do it last year, Verstappen arguably is even more dominant this year. The car seems to be an edge over everyone else. I'm just very keen on how... Yeah, I think, you know, it depends if it's wet or dry or semi-wet. You know, that's the, they're the three conditions in which we could have a Brazilian Grand Prix. If it's wet... It'll be interesting to see if if they're on top of the situation. As I say, I mean, we had some weird things whereby the clean side of the road is actually the slower side of the road in the wet, because that's where the rubber is these days. And then we had the Renault engine failure in Singapore because they started in second gear rather than first to avoid wheel spin, and because of the additional torque going through the engine and the compression and the piston that blew the engine. So, you know, these are weird things that are happening now that we never used to see in the rain. So those things, as I said, it'll be interesting to see how the Formula One teams are getting on top of that, if at all, if, if it is wet in Brazil. And on top of that, of course, all the regulations and how we get rid of the standing water and whether or not we see the full extreme wet in the future. So that's if it's wet. If it's dry, I can't see any way in the world that, Red Bull won't be the dominant car around there. And obviously, Max, totally confident now, mathematically with the second world championship now secured, you know, who's going to beat Max around there in a car as quick as that? Um, you know, in theory, it won't be a great circuit for Mercedes because it is bumpy. I'm sure it'll be bumpy, even if they try and resurface it. And if it's bumpy, they'll be on the limit in terms of vertical oscillation and all the other stuff. If it's wet, in theory, that should be nullified. But then Lewis was so slow in Singapore in the early laps in the wet, you know, it doesn't seem to apply anyway. So, you know, I suppose Mercedes will struggle there. And Ferrari, I guess it'll be a bit of a handful. They're probably right on the edge of, of downforce and where they can be. So you're probably going to see Carlos Sainz having a few moments and Charles maybe on Friday having a couple of um, 
events as well. But yeah, Ferrari will be quick there. There's no question it's a good car. And, and then you got the Alpine versus McLaren thing. And we saw how good the Alpine was around Suzuka compared with McLaren. And there's no reason why that car won't be good around Interlagos. I mean, it's all about aero efficiency these days. And if you've got an efficient car aerodynamically, you can transform that from circuit to circuit into let's improve the traction. Let's not run too low. Let's have a bit more top speed. Let's make sure we've got great turning. You can, you can filter in all those different commodities because you've got an aero efficiency advantage. If you're on the edge and you don't have that advantage, you're just at the limit of what the car's going to do. A bit like Alpha Tari all year, they don't have great aero efficiency. So they're constantly on the edge of balance, brake balance, roll center, whatever it is, everything's on the edge and, and it's never been, never an easy car to drive unless it's super slow, slow to slow corners that is. So yeah, mm. I, I don't think the patterns will change that much. Um, and I think, I think it'll be, you know, if, if the Red Bull, well, if it's dry, I can't see how Max would lose that race. If it's wet, uh, you might see, you know, something, something a bit different happening. Well, let's hope we just get some sort of competition at the very end. That's exactly what we're looking for this weekend with the circuit that generally can offer us that. But Peter, thank you so much for joining us on the Inside Line of One podcast this, this time. And we'd to have you on for a live watch as well. That's going to come up this weekend. So see you over there. And folks, if you're listening in and want to know how you can join it too, check out the link in the description for more information on how you can sign up and discuss the race in real time with Peter as it goes on. Thanks for listening, folks. Have a good time. Bye-bye.